Well, hey folks, are you digging into this new murder case out in Utah where a mom allegedly poisons and overdoses her husband only to throw a party the day after this guy dies and later write a grief book for children where she used his death for inspiration? Well, let's talk about the case that's taking our minds off of the murders in Idaho for just a minute. And tonight, we're going to be doing it from Washington, D.C. and the National Law Enforcement Memorial. Welcome to Profiling Evil. I'm working out of my Washington, D.C. office this week, and I, and I took advantage of being in town to spend just a little bit of time at the National Law Enforcement Memorial. This week is Police Week, and yesterday was National Law Enforcement Day. You know, I went over to the wall to just kind of walk and visit a few old friends. This wall has nearly 24,000 police officer names etched on its sides. Well, I stopped, as I said, to visit a few names that I know, and I even made a phone call to the surviving children of one of those names etched on the wall, Detective Dennis Westenhoff. Dennis was murdered the day after Valentine's Day. That ties into this goofy case in just kind of a weird way. But it was really kind of special to be there, and frankly, tearful to be there. You know, as I stood and was wiping the tears from my eyes while I stood at Dennis's to uh, where his name was etched, I inadvertently stepped backwards into a woman that was also standing there crying. But she had a real right. She was the surviving wife of a police officer who was murdered nine years ago. She was left to pick up the pieces and keep her little three children together after he was killed in the line of duty. And she spoke to me about the challenges she's faced raising those three kids. It really angered me to think of the pain that her family, their family, and the 500 plus families who had loved ones whose names were etched on this wall in just the past year. You know, there's a remarkable thing that happens at the police memorial during police week. The area is filled with surviving family members and friends of police officers who died in the line of duty. While I was there, I stopped and chatted with four separate people. All four were the surviving wives of police officers who had been killed in the line of duty. I asked them about their husbands, about their families, and about how their husbands were killed. I learned about these brave survivors, these women, and how they found ways to cope with the loss, and frankly, how they've grown from the pain that they went through. It was incredibly inspiring. And as I was leaving the memorial, my thoughts turn to the circumstances of tonight's video and my interview, which I'm going to do on Court TV in just a few moments with Vinnie Politan. It was all about the woman in Utah who's accused of poisoning her husband with a fentanyl lace drink last year. And if this thing proves to be true, her behavior after his death is not just as confusing, it's aggravating. You, you, you see, Corey Richens, that's her name, and it's the only time I'm going to say it, closed on a 10-acre piece of property and held a party just one day after her husband, Eric, suddenly, and according to reports, unexpectedly died in his sleep. A year later, and frankly just a week or so before she was arrested, she released her new book on grieving and the process that children go through. She dedicated that book to her now deceased husband. Well, here's what we know about the case as it stands today. Authorities are saying that this woman, now defendant, poisoned her husband with a lethal amount of fentanyl. Now, that's a drug that she purchased illegally, and she actually purchased it on several different occasions, evidence is going to show. The state's case suggests that the defendant made several attempts at killing her husband. Now, the first attempt occurred years earlier, three years earlier, while they were on vacation. That event was frightening enough for the husband that he mentioned it to a family member that he thought his wife was trying to poison him. 
Then fast forward to January of 2022, and this weird thing that we're going to talk about in just a moment about his life insurance policy happens. And then on Valentine's Day in 2022, this defendant allegedly tried to overdose her husband with fentanyl again. Now, while all this was happening, the wife was secretly attempting, I'm going to just step back to January for a minute, attempting to change the man's life insurance beneficiary so that she would be the sole benefactor. Well, the victim in this case discovered it, and he changed it back so that his business partner would receive some of the benefit if he were to die. But apparently concerned, he removed his wife as the recipient of his death policy and put the recipient, the benefactor name, in his business partner and his sister. Uh, I wonder if he heard about Charles Vallow and the moves that he made to keep Lori Vallow Daybell from stealing money that was intended to be used to take care of those children, specifically JJ. Hey everybody, it's Mike from Profiling Evil. I've been studying criminal behavior for more than 40 years, and one of my favorite research tools is Truthfinder. It's online, and you're not going to believe the information stored there. So if you want to know more about that new neighbor, your babysitter, or your next online date, give Truthfinder a try. I'm including a link below with special discount pricing. you got to click the link to get it, and then enter EVIL10 at checkout. We're an affiliate, which means we get a small commission, enough to buy a small diet Dr. Pepper, but you can cancel at any time. Thanks for listening today. Well then, on March 3rd of 2022, a month later, the defendant in this case allegedly mixed a drink that her, uh, for her husband as he was getting ready for bed. Now, apparently, she said she made this drink for him. When he started drinking it, she decided to go in the other room and sleep with one of her children, the alibi. She said this child was having a difficult time falling asleep. She also said that she left her phone in the bedroom where her husband was and that she fell asleep with the child. Well, at 3 a.m., she woke up and returned to her bedroom where she discovers her husband unresponsive. She then calls 911 and first responders came to the home and attempted to treat the man, but they determined that he was deceased. Now, I'm not sure how concerned law enforcement was from the get-go on this case, but clearly they would have had some major red flags that were causing them concern. Now, the first major red flag would be that moment they looked at the deceased husband. You see, during the 911 call, the wife was instructed by the dispatcher to give the man CPR until medical care provide, uh, arrived. She indicated that she, in fact, did that. Well, the very moment the paramedics began working on the man, they realized that this was not truthful and that nobody had attempted CPR or any resuscitative effort for that matter, including mouth to mouth. And the major red flag? They made a note in their reports that there was a large amount of blood in his mouth and throat, inconsistent with anybody having attempted some life-saving measures. As the investigation continued, more red flags started waving. It wasn't long after his death that family notified police, and now this is according to media reports, folks, that Eric, this is the victim, had confided in one of his sisters that he believed his wife was trying to poison him. He spoke of a trip they took three years earlier, a trip to Greece, when the defendant gave the victim a drink that made him violently ill. Now, all of this was starting to come together, and it seems like a really important element of all of the events in totality here. And then he discovers in January of last year that his wife had removed his business partner's name from his life insurance policy and make, made her the sole beneficiary if he were to die. Well, after discovering this, he, he changed the policy back. But this time, unbeknownst to his wife, I assume, he removed her name from the policy and he made his sister the beneficiary. And he also gave his sister power of attorney. I mean, can you imagine how angry she must have been when she found out? It really makes you wonder if she found out before or after he died. And it makes me think of that phone call that Lori Vallow Daybell made where she said he changed the policy. 
she didn't know. And I don't think this person knew. But then, on Valentine's Day of 2022, reports say that the defendant purchased Eric a sandwich. And after he took one bite, he broke out into hives and he couldn't breathe. He actually had to get his son's EpiPen. And he took a bunch of Benadryl to recover, but he passed out and took several hours. He may have even thought he was dying at that point. Then, of course, the event on March 3rd and March 4th, the day he dies. A medical examiner finds five times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his system. This is a painkiller. Now, fentanyl is, is a problem we're having across the United States and, frankly, in other countries now. But fentanyl is 100 times stronger than morphine. Morphine's the drug they gave in the battlefield when soldiers were hit by bullets, folks. Now, another red flag was evident when the defendant threw a party the day after Eric died. I mean, does this feel like Groundhog Day and that we're watching Lori Daybell following Charles Vallow's death? And now we're starting to learn about some of the forensic evidence that's going to prove really valuable in this case. For instance, for one big thing, that mobile phone. The defendant, if you recall, said to police, or at least this is what's being reported, that she left her phone in the master bedroom with her husband when she went to sleep with and comfort that child. Now, what police have discovered since then is that phone was actually activated a number of times during that period of time when she was reportedly out of the room. Now, it's possible that he could have been looking in the phone or as he's dying and trying to get help trying to use the phone. But reports are suggesting that it was the defendant that was using the phone. And let's not forget about the physical evidence that suggests that the defendant wasn't being truthful about attempting CPR or mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. And of course, the attempt to change the life insurance policy. And don't forget Eric's declaration that his wife was trying to kill him and the suggestion that he was considering divorce, but he was staying out of fear of separation from his children. This guy seemed like he was a good dad who really loved his children. Now, other news reports are suggesting that the defendant may have also been involved romantically with somebody else, and evidence is suggesting that she was purchasing illegal drugs, even those drugs that led to Eric's death. So now, just weeks before she was arrested, the defendant appeared on a local television station to promote her new book on grieving called Are You With Me? During the interview, she spoke of how shocked she was when her husband died and how she wrote the book to guide her three sons through their grief. Well, now these boys, ages 10, 9, and 6, have lost their father and probably their mother as she sits in the Summit County Jail awaiting a hearing. Why not just get the divorce? Man. Well, it might prove to be all about money and about property. But I jumped on Court TV with Vinnie Politan tonight to talk about this case in detail. And I wanted to share some of that with you. Let's bring in our guest tonight. Joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah, religious cult expert, retired police commander, host of the Profiling Evil podcast, and author of the book Deceived about the Zion Society cult. Mike King is with us. Mike King, I want to read for you from the uh, probable cause statement, the David, the warrant. Take a listen here. 322 AM, March 4th, 2022, sheriff's deputies and EMS respond to the report of an unresponsive mail. Eric Richens was found on the floor at the foot of his bed. The only people in the house were Eric, his wife, Corey, and their children. Corey said around 9 o'clock that night, she made Eric a Moscow mule. Eric consumed it while sitting in bed. Corey said she went to bed shortly after and slept in one of the children's rooms. She said she awoke around 3 a.m., found Eric, who was cold, and called 911. Corey told law enforcement when she left her cell phone in her bed bedroom when she went into her child's room. The phone shows that it was locked and unlocked several times between when she said she was in the child's room. Tolls on the defendant's uh, phone show that messages were sent and deleted. Okay, what stands out to you in all of this, Mike King? 
sent and deleted, Vinny. That's the most important thing here because to me, there's lots of explanations you can come up with. You can say, okay, maybe he's in some kind of a medical event and he tries to use her phone and he's confused and doesn't know it's her phone. But he didn't delete messages that he did after if that was the, the case. So I think this one's going to boil down to a totality of the evidence. We've talked about it a lot on your show about the idea that there's physical evidence, forensic evidence. And in this case, we might have some eyewitness evidence. We don't know what these children are going to be able to say. And we're going to have behavioral evidence up the gazoo. Because when you start looking at the, the uh, financial records, the timing of the drug purchases, other things, all of a sudden it starts to come together painting a much different picture. All alone, you could maybe explain it out, but not together. Mike King, the other part that we're learning here is that the allegations by investigators that they were able to track her reaching out to some folks who were looking for the fentanyl. Um, how important is that part of the investigation and how reliable do you think um, those type of witnesses are because they're people I guess who are dealing in the the street drug the street drug version of fentanyl it's always the question isn't it is how far do you trust the the dope dealer or someone else but the bottom line is it's the timing of things and the fact that they apparently according to what we're reading in public record is that they have a drug purchase a drug called fentanyl purchased we then have a, a fentanyl event and that a previous time, just before uh, Valentine's Day, there was another major drug purchase and then this uh, event that occurs on Valentine's Day. So it becomes circumstantial. And I don't think it's much of a jump for people to say, man, if every time this person buys dope, there's an event that could have cost life and eventually does cost, cost life, then it becomes a pretty strong circumstantial case. Mike King, I've got more from that um, warrant for you. CL told detectives the defendant, that would be Corey, asked for prescription pain medication between December 21st and February of 2022. Um, CL gave defendant hydrocodone pills. Two weeks later, defendant contacted them for something stronger. Some of that Michael Jackson stuff. CL gave defendant 15 to 30 fentanyl pills for $900. February 14th, Valentine's Day. Eric and the defendant had a Valentine's Day dinner. Eric became very ill, believed he had been poisoned. Eric told a friend that he thought his wife was trying to poison him. February 26th, defendant purchases $900 worth of pills from CL. March 4th, 2022, Eric Richens found dead from a fentanyl overdose. I think you can put these pieces together pretty logically, Mike. I, I agree with you, Vinny, and I think this is what's so interesting about this particular case is it's going to be really hard to overcome those coincidences. But I think this one, again, is going to be all about the fact that there is physical evidence, there's forensic evidence. Uh, it's really difficult to, to give a reason why you changed a life insurance policy without the person who the policy is under knowing about it. It's really difficult to, to say this was a drug event if his history, and they're going to be able to show this, physical exams and, and other doctor visits, if he was suffering from back pain that required illegal drugs, there's going to be a record that he was in talking to a doctor trying to figure out what to do with it earlier. And we heard Scordis earlier talking about the fact that there is nothing from their perspective that suggests this man had a drug problem or drug addiction or was even using it. So I think when we start compiling all these pieces and parts together, it's going to be a really big challenge for the defense to overcome that. I look at that book cover and I hope that little boy is running away from his mother because <laughs> he's running fast. Um, Dr. Carol Lieberman, great insight tonight. Mike King uh, joining us actually from D.C. for Police Week this week. Uh, Mike, uh, great to see you. Thanks for taking time out from that big uh, celebration down in D.C. And we'll see you both again really, really soon. Well, thanks for watching, folks. And I'm looking forward to your comments down below. Do you think the state has enough evidence on just what you've seen to convict this woman of murder? I think it's pretty shaky, but I think when the trial gets rolling, we're going to see all the forensic, physical, perhaps eyewitness, and most importantly, behavioral evidence roll out in this case. Hey, make sure you're hitting that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. And please, folks, consider joining our channel memberships. 
My favorite is the academy level where you get a whole lot more for just a little bit more. And remember that your donation really helps us out as we try to put out good quality content. Hey, I'm coming from my offices in Washington, DC. And you can see the Capitol and, and the monuments there over my shoulder. I just wanna say thanks for supporting us here at Profiling Evil. And make sure you're checking us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, here on YouTube. And folks, if you like uh, podcasts, audio podcasts, check out Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. We're averaging about 3,000 downloads a week, which is absolutely fantastic. And we're so thrilled about that. So thanks again. And we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene.